Welcome to week six. And for me, this one, uh, has, as, I, as I indicated in my email, um, after mulling a particular problem for weeks and seeing certain answers, um, I, I suddenly the other night realized that while the answer, other answers are nice, they're not correct. The, I, I now have the right, the right approach, what I believe is the right approach, and I think you will all agree. Um, on penalty of no, the uh, I, I think I think in general, once you see it, it, it becomes very clear. But we'll get to that. We began the second parak, the second chapter last week. We introduced Zerubbabel as a key figure and uh, and leader. Discussed a little bit the question of the interaction between Sheish Batzar and Zerubbabel, which we have not yet really uh, resolved. And then we started the opening two sentences, the list of the people who are in authority. We talked about this term, B'nai HaMedina. Um, I believe I sent out a follow-up email last week after the class to note that Medina is, generally speaking, a later term, something that you start to see in the time of Yirmiyahu and, uh, and later. We did have um, one or two uses of it that were earlier. And uh, in general, Medina is not Israel. It's actually more often a broad term for, uh, for the nations. Okay, so we listed those who came back with Zerubbabel as leaders. We went through the names and just noted some of them and in particular notes about, uh, about some of those leaders. And that brings us to the list of the, na- the nations, of the nations, the list of the members of the nation with their names and their totals. As we already noted, this list is somewhat different from the list that will appear in Nehemiah 7, and we'll have to talk about that when we get there. And we talked about why this list is present at all, and we've given, in general, three approaches for why we have these name lists. One approach being that this was just this was what they viewed as poetry; it was the poetic style. Second view, noted by Rabbi Angel, is that it emphasizes the importance of the people as opposed to the construction of the temple, which will not be given that kind of uh, that kind of real estate. And then the third approach that it makes the list look longer by listing everybody who came and their numbers, and then on the other hand, sort of competing with that, the fact that you can count them at all indicates that it's actually a depressing thing, that you know, the, the, uh, the fact that you're able to number everybody. So those are all reasonable explanations for what the list does. But as I said, I think we're gonna see another point of view for why there are lists, and I think that, that, um, that that's actually stronger. So we're going to come back to that um, in a little bit. But first of all, when we look at this list, we will see that some of the people are listed as children of a particular family, and others are listed as being descendants from a particular location. So for example, if you take a look on page 1815 in the Stone Tanakh, we're going to list the children of Parosh, Shafatia, Arach, those are people. At the same time, if you flip the page, you're going to see on page 1817, when you get to verse 21, 22, 23, they stop calling them the children of in the English because they're trying to note for you the fact that even though the word is b'nai, here, these are people who originated in a particular city. Some of them accounts by city, while some of them accounts by, by family. Why would it do that? Why would you list some people in the census based on their location and some people based on their clan? Depends on their level of like if they really oh, that's interesting. So the preference would be family, but in the event that no one cares about that family, then we'll just do the place. Mm-hmm. Or vice versa, right? It could be they come from a good zip code, or postal code, excuse me. The, um, then that's what we're going to list, and otherwise we'll list the, uh, the family, maybe. Holly, you were going to say? Uh, family, same family, but one in one city, one in another city, but still members of the same family. Mm. So what happens if you have a family that's scattered? Mm-hmm. So then, so you think they'll be listed based on city then? No, no by, by, family. Family. by family. Or that's when we will list them by family. And when they're in the city that they came from, where they're connected to, they might be Uh-huh. Connected. So the preference is, which, then which one is the preferred way to do it? I get confused with this. I would have thought family would be the preferred way because it's a clearer identifier. Mm-hmm. Ralph, is, 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 is it possible that yeah. <laughs> the entree are people who remain and 
kept this place alive, and the others were from Babylon and came back? No, because these are all returnees. It's a census of the people who come with them, who come with Zerubbabel. That, that wouldn't work. It's a nice idea, but I don't think it would work. Yeah? I was saying that uh, some of the uh, places, uh, they left on um, our top, the place of the Kalmanim, and um, later on we got Yericho. Uh, a lot of these places are really significant places. And Kiryati Arim, Arim, so these are right. all the significant places. And that's perhaps why uh, now we're going to move to some significant places. Right, so in other words, flipping the idea from family to places, saying that it's actually place. If you have a prestigious area, that's what's going to come first. And if you don't, all right, fine, they're from this family. Could be, yes. Just, we tend to, you know, going back, we tend to make a big deal about family. We function in families mm -hmm. so that when they can be identified with their families, they're put with families, and when they've now been dispersed and possibly in towns, they are now, because they can no longer be identified or don't identify with their families, now they are listed by the towns. Right. So, so Malbim, I'm just going to, I'm going to move with it. Take a look at number one. At source number one, Malbim seems to think that the priority is family. Family would be the would be the way to do it. Achas, those who are from one family, even if they dwell in many cities, it combined them based on the head of the family. So they would all be listed based on the uh, based on on clan. However, if they did not unite by family, if they didn't identify that way, then it's here from Al Shema Ir Shagarusham Tchila. Then it went with their city of origin. But the default is family. And then we'll use city where that doesn't work. That also makes sense in that the breakdown of the census is going to be Yisraelim, Kohanim, Leviim, and other lineages, as we'll see. So it fits. The whole focus really is a lineage focus, and it's just where lineage breaks down, down geographic location. This is a group of people who came from this city or that city or the other city. Yes, Ralph. What's the significance between using B'nai and Anshe? Oh. So it's not. It's not. It's Anshe. It's B'nai only in the Hebrew. Oh, you have you have a couple of places where it has... Yeah, B'nai. With the cities, it's B'nai. It's B'nai. With the families, it's Anshay. No, it's actually, it's actually, go back and look more, more closely. You're right that there is one place where it uses the word Anshay. Twice it is. Once or twice that it's Anshay, but generally it's B'nai, whether it's by, by family or whether it's by place. Right, there are some Anshays. You're right, there are some Anshays. But overall, it's B'nai. The question is an interesting question of, so then why, why are there Anshays at all? I haven't seen anybody address that. But yeah, but it's not consistent. Because you couldn't say the name of Tofa. You have to, if you're going to go by the place. Why couldn't you? Well, there are other places where it's Bene. Bene Kiryad Arim. Ah, okay. That's correct. So, yes, I don't know. You, you don't have to stand there. Yeah. I just want to know, if, is it possible that this whole exercise is really a way of establishing a pedigree, a blue kind of thing? Oh, yes. I'm saying maybe that's why there's, you had asked the question. I don't know. I yeah. must have discussed it when I came back. But I was wondering if the, the reason for this whole very um, precise list, an yeah. all encompassing list, is to see who were the people that were without a doubt on the, of the right lineage. They so hold that thought. I'm going to it, It's a good thought. Hold that thought. I'm going to come back to that in about five minutes. But um, what Gina is saying, I think, it links into a bigger idea regarding the lists as a whole. So, yes, the answer is yes, and I want to, I want to build on that soon. And the flip side of that is, when we're talking about places that come from, are these land claims that are being made? So, right. Advance? If it had been all of cities, I would have said the goal is to stake your claim. This is where I came from, and this is where I plan to go back. Because they already said people return to their cities. But it doesn't quite work across the board because we have a whole bunch, really majority, that are done by family, and they're not families of unknown location. It's not. It's not like that. So, so that's what makes it more difficult to, to say that. Another point that I wanted to address within this list is the question that Helene asked me at the end last time, which is how is it that Ezra does a census? I thought you're not supposed to count Jews. Mm -hmm. Right? What happened to that rule that you're not supposed to be, you know, we're not supposed to count ourselves? There's even, it's considered a prohibition holding a, uh, a census. And if it's not a census, then how do you explain the fact that each family or location is listed with numbers? So, what is it that we're doing? 
I haven't found any rabbinical objection to the census. There's nowhere. Whereas, you know, David gets in trouble for doing a count. No one says Ezra did something wrong and there was a plague and they were punished. And they, you don't find anything to hint that. In fact, if you take a look at number two, you find a medrash, Sikta de Rav Kahana, in which they talk about ten times when the Jews were counted. Were counted. And number nine is this one in the days of Ezra. The eight, previous eight appear in Tanakh, and this is the ninth. And it's just mentioned, like, yeah, this is one of the ten great biblical censuses. He's not I. counting the Jewish people. Sorry? He's not counting the Jewish people. He's counting only the returnees, a small portion. We don't allow you to count a subset, right? We don't, we're not, we're not, we don't, we don't accept, a as a matter of halacha, we don't accept censuses of any population, right? It, it, it doesn't matter the size. Well, maybe we learn from here that you are right. But we know no one uses this as a basis to permit it. Meaning, this is a halachic discussion. It came up in Israel when they started doing censuses of the population, and there were people who refused to participate. There's a, there's a, there's halachic literature on this uh, on this topic. No one ever quotes this as justification. So why is it not? Um, so that's the question. What what's going on, Shana? They have to put down a coin. Right. So unfortunately, again, it's not used as a halakhic distinction because we're dealing with this as a legal debate. There is, you know, there is no end to the material we have on censuses in Jewish law, and everyone who's written on it, you know, has has written a great deal, and they haven't limited it to the military context. If I go into uh, a, uh, if I go into the room there, the the Beit Midrash at four thirty. 425, whatever time it is, and they're waiting for a minion, and someone says, yeah. do we have a minion? They will not say, we have one, two, three, four, five. They'll say, Hoshia Samacha, or they'll use one of the other ways, or the, the profound not one, not two, right? <laughs> Why that works, I don't know. The, uh, you can see. The, yeah, no, you didn't get a 20, that, that doesn't work. The, so, the question is, what, what is this? So, the simple answer that I would give is that we already find within Tanakh permitted methods of doing a census. I gave you references to them in number three, but don't look them up right now, please. I don't want to make this the focus. The first one, Shmot, Perak Lamed, Ralph mentioned it quietly uh, over here, is the use of the half shekel. When Moshe does the census, Kisi Saz, Rosh B'nai Yisrael, when you're going to count them, so the way you do it is each person will give a half shekel. So maybe here... Ezra did a collection, and based on the collection, that was how we determined the number. And that would be one approach. But that was him being, he was commanded to do that. Which was different from David, who was not told to do that. No, but he was commanded to do a census, but to but, do it with a half shekel. Right, I understand. David uh, is a census of his own initiative, right, exactly. and without the half shekel. Right, but, the, but isn't the greater thing that he did it on his own initiative? I didn't think so. I oh, thought it was okay. the, I, I, didn't, I didn't think so. The, um, the, second, um, the second approach is when Shaul does the count with, um, with Bezek, not the phone company. The name um, <laughs> of Bezek, which is explained to me either shards or stones in order to do a census. Although there, the Gemara comments on that, that that may not be shards or stones. It may be the location where he did the census. The place was called Bezek. But then the third... Um, third source there is before the, the Jews go to war with Amalek under Shaul, and there it's explicit, he counted them with sheep, which is not the same thing as counting sheep. The, but he counted them with sheep, again, not wanting to count them as one, two, three, four, five. I mean, you're probably familiar with the usual approach for, to explain why we don't count ourselves. Right? The idea that we are part of a community, and counting individuals isolates people from the whole. That's the general opposition. So if you do it by counting sheep, each person has a sheep, you put the sheep into the pen, and then you count up how many sheep you have, now you've done it without, um, w- without isolating anybody from the community. That's the basic idea for why um, we don't do a, a census. So the answer may be that Ezra simply did it with one of these methods. He did the half shekel, or he did a shard, or whatever it was, but nobody that I have seen in Medrash Gemara or later writers, 
has voiced any discomfort with what Ezra did here. So I have to assume that their answer will be that he did it in one of the permissible ways, even though the text does not give us any sort of discussion at all of the, uh, of the method involved. Okay. But let's come to the big question, the key to these name lists. And I, you know, I mentioned already a few minutes ago the three basic answers we've already given, but I'd like to suggest a fourth, which is along the lines of what, uh, what Janine said before. Take a look, please, on your sheet at source number four. Mishnah and Tanis. And this was what... It, once I started reading the names that we had on the list and remembered them from here, then it, was, it all became very clear. This is talking about... This is in context. It's part of a discussion in the Mishnah in the last chapter of Tanis that talks about various festivals and holidays, days of celebration. And one of the days of celebration is for a particular family when it brings a korban eitzim, when it brings wood that will be used on the Mizbeach. What happens is there are national holidays that we are familiar with, and then there are holidays for individuals. If I am bringing a sacrifice to the temple, to the base Hamikdash, it's a holiday for me. That's why Erev Pesach has the status of a Yom Tov in Halacha for all sorts of practical purposes because you bring the korban Pesach. So along the same lines, on the day when various families would bring wood for the Mizbeach, they would celebrate. But it wasn't a random thing. Like I woke up one day, looked out at the trees in my forest and said, I think it's time for me to bring wood to the, to the base HaMikdash. You had a particular day. And that was when you brought wood. And it, the people who brought were not just anybody who wanted. But there was a structure to it based on families. Now look at these families. Zman Atze Kohen and Ve'ha'am Tisha. There are nine dates for wood to be brought for the Kohanim and the nation. Me and the Kohanim and the nation brought. Not all of these are non-Kohanim. Be'echad ben Nisan, b'nei Orach ben Yehuda. The first of Nisan, Orach ben Yehuda. The 20th of Tammuz, David ben Yehuda. Whether that's the Davidic line literally or whether that's somebody else named David who happened to be from the tribe of Yehuda, I don't know. B'chamisha ba'av, parosh ben Yehuda. And so on down the list. So... Here. Parosh is here. You got it. All of them, except for Yonadav ben Rechev, who has his own story in Tanakh and Sefer Yirmiyahu, but other than Yonadav ben Rechev, all of them are figures from our list. And that made me start to think about what our list is really doing. Add to that source number five. Also from that same discussion in Tanis. Tanu Rabbanan, Arba Mishmaros Alu Minagola. Four shifts came out of the exile. What happens is there's a pasuk in the Torah, it's in Sefer Bamidbar, which says that the Kohanim get to eat portions of the Karbanot. They each get to exchange or to eat shares. Aside from whatever was exchanged, sold literally, by their ancestors. And what that means is that there were ancestral shifts of Kohanim who worked in the Beis Hamikdash. Families, in other words, it wasn't just open season. Any Kohen on any day could show up at the base and make this and say, I want to do the service. Rather, you had shifts, and there was a rotation. And the Gemara describes how they started out with a certain number of shifts, and then as the number of Kohenim increased, then they divided up into greater numbers of shifts. And that you can see in Tanakh. In Divrei Hayyamim, we get shifts of Kohenim. So what we're told here is that there were only four Mishmarot, four shifts, who came out of the exile, as in the beginning of the second temple, and it lists them. Yedaya, Charim, Pashkur, and Imar. And you look at it and say, how do you know that there were just four and those were the four? And the answer is, because it's right here in our list. When we look at our list, when it gets to the Kohanim, for which you want to look at... Actually, it's easier to use my Don Mikra than the art school one. Yeah, right, thank you. Verse 36... Starting with verse 36, you can see it very clearly in the English, actually, in the, uh, in the Tanakh, because they, they break it apart. So you have Yedaya, right? You see it there? Yedaya, Imer, Pashkur, and Karim. There's your, there is your list, or Imer, the, um, there's your list of four. So the Gemara is just saying, well, I guess that means there are four shifts. And then the prophets divided them up into 24 because that was the system, was a system of 24. So they were subdivided, the subfamilies, into 24 ships. And so 
looking at those two sources, I wondered if this isn't really what the name lists are about. What you see among the Jews who are returning for the second Beis HaMikdash is, I, I use a word now that I don't mean pejoratively, the aristocracy. This is the structure of what is going to happen, everything that will happen going forward for the Jews in the period of the Second mm -hmm. Temple is based on those families who are identified here. It's almost like, if I can use a Harry Potter reference, right? which house are you in? Right? You trace all the way back to your, to your founders, and this one is a Slytherin, or this one is a Gryffindor, or whatever it's going to be, based on the original founder, and they've traced their line, and that's where I come from. It's a, it's a nobility type of a thing. These are your Mayflower to go, you know, to, to switch metaphors to the United States. These are your Mayflower families. So the, the families are by status, and then everyone else is by city. Is that what you're saying? I'm saying that the families and the cities. These are just my best ways to right. identify people, whether it's family or it's city based. Um, but these are the people who set up the hierarchy for everything going forward. They're establishing all the institutions in the new land, and it will always be by their name, and therefore. We will have lists in this book, which is go which are going to identify the creators of that new structure. You follow? Yeah. You use aristocracy. I was thinking more purity because I think of Ezra later cleaning up the mixed marriages and trying to do a bloodline for lack of any other. Um, yeah, and that's so. It, yeah, more more the religious, as it were, end of it than just the powerful. Right. So I think I think the religious piece of it does come in even at the end of this list when we're going to get done with Cohen and Levi Yisrael and start talking about people who don't know how to identify their lineage or who come from a lineage that's not one of the standard honored ones but bespeaks a problem. The, um, I think that that we're going to see that as well. I think that's that that's I think you're right. I think that, that is another element of it that um, that makes this this listing important. There I would have just said, though, if you wanted to only do that, you would have just said, well, here are the problem people, or here are the pure people. You know, and then you know, if they're not on the pure list, there's a problem, or you know, that would be a, a way to do it. But I think this is, I think it's what we're doing here. That's where you were going. Good. Baruch um, Shekivan. But after, you know, after a month of wondering why in the world do we have these name lists, and looking at the different answers, which I think are nice answers. I think whatever Angel has to say it, it, you know, has something to recommend it. And I think the idea that this was poetry for them also is something they recommend it. But I think fundamentally the utilitarian purpose of this list is these are the founders of your society. And they are the ones who govern the institutions as they go forward. And whatever you fall into in this list is going to determine who you are in that society that they have, uh, that they have established. I think, that's what's, I think that's what's going on and why there's so much real estate for these, uh, for, for these names. They're the signers of Declaration of Independence. Yeah, John essentially. <laughs> essentially, if my, if my Canadian history were better, which is to say existent, then uh, you know, I, could give, um, I, I could give a better explanation of it in Canadian context, but I'll trust you to do that. Oh, there's a confederation. Okay, confederates. The, I'm sorry. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Right. So Dalga asks, if these people are so great, why doesn't anybody name their kid Parosh? <laughs> they, um, I chose Parosh on purpose. Because Parosh, what is Parosh in modern Hebrew? To separate. No, not, that's Luke Parosh. Parosh with an I in the middle. It's a louse. It's some kind of a louse, a flea. Right. A louse. No, but Wait, they, we would be using these names. No, no, no. There's so many good names the name we don't use. Of a family of poets. A very famous family. Yeah, but these are supposed poets. to be Mayflower names. Come yes. On. They, they're not. I see that. I think that's a bad. I think that's a bad analogy. Mm -hmm. In order to set up to to reestablish a Jewish um, uh, whatever mm -hmm. um, or uh, what? I'm sorry. Presence, presence. You, you're, you're going to have to have a temple. A temple only runs with Kohanim and Levi. They have to know what's there, and that's that's the structure of our community. And that's why he needs it. Whether whatever their names are, he has to know where they are. That's the right. way that's we not. have it. But that's what she fine. said. I agree with you. So we, that's, that's why we have to the names of people who are important. Doesn't do it for me. But it's not important. But they are people. Who are, but they're not, they're not important in the sense of these are saints. They're important in the sense that they are the names you will see associated with all of your institutions. That's the key. 
And in terms of the question of why we don't use them, it's because we tend to read Chumash and stop. <laughs> Meaning there are all sorts of great names throughout Navi that are of unquestionably good people. And yet, you know, no one's ever going to use them. Certain people manage, they have mazel. Certain people catch the spotlight, Ya'el, even though she's in Shoftim, right? Shimshon for another. Um, and they will, you know, they will get the spotlight. And then other names people don't really use. I mean, I know a handful of people, if that name, Yoshiyahu. He's one of the greatest kings we ever had. I think I can think of one offhand. I probably know a couple more that I don't realize Yishai their name is Yoshiyahu. Yeah, Sorry? Yeshaya Leibovich? That That's Yeshaya. It's just Yeshaya. Just Yeshaya. Okay. Yeah, sure. Yes. I want to go back to the cities for a minute. Apart from a few, like Big Lechem and Lod, I don't recognize these names particularly. So I'm going to go through the names as we go through each puzzle. Yeah. yeah, some of them, right, of these cities as well. Okay. Yeah, some of them we certainly do know. Yeah. A couple of them are obscure. A couple of them are obscure to us, that's for sure, which speaks to the fact that this is 2,500 years ago. You know, I mean, that's 2,500 years of turmoil, not just 2,500 years, but conquest after conquest after conquest. You know, I, I think that will do that. But I, I think it, I, I think it, we should start a campaign for people to name their kids Pachat Moab or something. You know? <laughs> yeah, I didn't succeed. I had a campaign on naming my children, and I lost. And, and it's a good thing. I wanted to name one of my daughters Chefzi Ba. Yeah. And your wife, who was very smart. Yeah, that's correct. That's the problem. Yeah. Yeah. What's his name? Um, but even in the Chumash, there are lots of names that, that we don't use. Well, also because some of them are Bukhi and Yahweh. Yeah. I mean, there's more to be said, but I'm going to go a little further now. Okay. Okay. That's not what we're learning. Quite a few of these who we're going to see are associated with Yehuda very clearly. Dot Mikra, I didn't, I didn't go into it in terms of what I'm going to say, just because the, um, I know that not everybody is interested in the, the details of each name. But the Dot Mikra actually does quite a bit of research to show which ones of the names are Yehuda names versus which ones are Binyamin names, where it's possible to identify them. But the opening ones, like Pasuk Gimel and Pasuk Yud, are basically names of families who we know our families from Yehuda. So in Pasuk Gimel, chapter 2, sentence 3, you're on page 1815, if you're using the stone Tanakh. B'nai Parosh. So again, Parosh in modern Hebrew, um, and not just modern Hebrew, but even in Talmudic Hebrew, um, is a reference to some type of louse or some type of a bug. The, um, Here it says flea. Okay, a flea over there. The... Um, that shouldn't surprise you, right? Devora. What's a devora? A bee. A bee. What's a cholda? Cholda anavia. A rodent of some kind. It's a rat. The um, a rat, a weasel. Yeah. It depends how bad you want it to be. The but you know there is such a thing of you know, we we have given names we have given names that are not necessarily flattering in terms of the creatures with whom they are they are associated. I don't know of anyone who's named their kid Chazer, but uh, <laughs> as a general rule. Nickname, nickname. Um, but as a general rule, you should know that such names did exist. And in fact, as Dot Mikra points out, in non-Jewish Semitic cultures, you also find the name Parosh used. So it was something that existed within within that society. People naming their kid uh, their kid Parosh. Go figure. <laughs> Bnei Shefatia, which they, oh sorry, so Bnei Parosh is Alpayim Mea Shiva Mushnayim. So that gives us um, one thousand one hundred and seventy two. B'nai Shafatya, a nice name. That name sounds like one people should use. God as a judge. The Shlosh Meo Shivim Mushnai, 372. I'm going through the numbers only because one of these numbers is going to matter out of all of them. B'nai Arach, Shva Meos Hamisha Veshivim. Arach is 775. 775. Arach is one of those wood donors, just like Parosh was. B'nai Fachas Moav. Livne Yeshua Yoav Alpayim Shmona Meos Ushne Masar. 1812 for this one. This one is a strange one on multiple levels. I'm curious to see how your translations render this. B'nai, B'nai, not the number problem, uh, 2000, sorry, 2812, thank you. But the, the, the strange part I'm talking about is in the name context. They call it here, I'm looking at the English in the art scroll, the children of the governor of Moab. 
of the children of Yeshua and Yoav. So I get a little lost in reading this and trying to figure out who is who in this story, not to mention who is the governor of Moab. It's true, Pecha is a term that we're going to use in this book to refer to an appointed governor. What Jew was ever appointed as governor of Moab? So that's a problem, but also just the sentence structure. I don't read the sentence. So yeah, Ibn Ezra offers an explanation, but what I like really is the, the Mitzudat David and Malbum approach. If you take a look at source number six, this is the structure we're going to see for a few of the names. So we have to parse it and figure out how it works. He says, Rotzalomar, meaning, Min B'nai Yeshua, Umin B'nai Yoav, from the families of Yeshua and Yoav, Shayu B'nai Pachas Moab, who were themselves the children of Pachas Moab. So there were two families that were known as the descendants of Pachat Moab, of the governor of Moab. And Misparamayu, their number together is 2,000 and so on. So the way to read it is B'nai Pachas Moab, at the top, Yeshua and Yoav as the two branches, and this is their number. That's what JPS does. That's what JPS does. A with a colon and with a, with a colon. Yeah, and a hyphen. And a hyphen. Okay. And not a hyphen, a dash. That's a dash. That's right. What's the difference? Uh, between a dash and a hyphen? Yes, yeah, they're we'll different. We'll talk later about punctuation. Oh, my. Okay. <laughs> okay. I will learn the difference between a dash and a hyphen. I'm that I actually learned it in school. So, Papa Noah. Moab is not a name, it's a position. Not Correct. No, it, it is assumed to be that this is, the word pecha is so clearly a position of a governor <coughs> that everybody assumes that this is, in fact, a, a position. The only question is, so who are we talking about? So the Gemara Tanis offers a suggestion. Take a look at source number seven. B'nai pachas Moab ben Yehuda. The, he says, Hain, hain, b'nai David ben Yehuda, divrei Rabbi Meir. Rabbi Meir says this is actually David. The governor of Moab is David. Rabbi Yossi Omer, hey name b'nei Yoav ben Surya. Rabbi Yossi says it's actually Yoav. What in the world are you talking about? Why would either of them be identified as Pachat Moab? Yeah, because both of them, sorry? Descended from Ruth. Both of them are descended, both of them are descended from Ruth of Moab. So Pachat Moab means not the governor of Moab, but the leader who was from Moab, is the way that the uh, is the way that the Gemara plays it. Okay. Pasuk Zion, sentence seven. I, I mean, now I'm, now I want to know what this is about dashes and hyphens. This I got. Yeah, a hyphen joins two words. A dash is a pause. Really? Yes. I never knew that. Okay. Maybe it's a question of what language you're talking about. Canadian American. I'm yeah. being smart. Maybe you. Yeah, that's American grammar. Keep that in mind. Well, no, no, but it's, maybe it's American. She said a hyphen is a joining of two words. A dash is a pause. That's right. Do you notice the people who know? We are all over teachers. A certain name. It's actually separation. It's not a dash, it's an and dash. All right. All right. We've had enough now. The. Um, <laughs> Yeah. 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 Right. No, that's a different hyphen. That's a different. Remind me later. I'll explain that hyphen to you. That one I can explain. Okay. B'nai Elam, Elaf Masayim Chamishim Ve'arba. Pasuk Zayin, sentence seven. The sons of Elam, one thousand two hundred and fifty-four. Elam is also the name of a nation, but that's not what we mean here. It's a popular name among Jews, so much so that in Pasuk Lam and Aleph, we're going to get another Elam. So there's this Elam, who is assumed to be from Yehuda, and then in Lam and Aleph, we have another, another Elam who's from, uh, who's from Binyamin. So Elam is 1254. Bnei Zatu, the sons of Zatu. Zatu was another one of the wood donors. Shameos Barboyan Bachamisha, 945. We're now up to Pasuk uh, Tet, sentence 9. B'nei Zakai. Zakai, like Yohanan ben Zakai. That, that name. Shvameos Vishishim, 760. B'nei Vani, Sheishmeos Arboyan Ushnayim. The sons of Vani, 642. 642 for Vani. Okay. B'nei Vevai. Rather than BB. Bnei Vevai, Sheshme has a Simu Shlosha, Vevai is 623. Bnei Azgad, Elef Masayim Esim Ushnayim. 
Okay, Asgard is, what is it, 1222. Bnei Adoni come, Sheish Me'o 666. How do you like that one? For, uh, for Adoni come. Bnei Vigvai. Vigvai is a name that should be familiar. No, from the list earlier, the one that we saw last week. When we had the list of those who came with Zubavel as the leaders, Vigvai was one of the leaders. Or Big Vai is one of the leaders. So now we get his family, and it's Abhayim Chamisha Mishisha, the uh, 2056. Bnei Adin. Adin was another one of the wood donors. Arba Meot Chamishim Verba, 454. And that's the name that people use, Dalia. We got Adin on the list. That's the name that people use. Bnei Ater Lichizkia, Tishim Ushmona. Ater to Chizkia, 98. So the children of Ater, sorry? Small number. It is a very small number. But the other question is, what is Ater of Chizkia? He's the royal line. So the way they translate it here is the children of Ater of Chizkia, meaning that they are descended from Chizkia. In other words, Chizkia is descendant Ater. And that's the way that, um, that Mitzudat David takes it. That's the, um, I think that's a standard approach. Ibn Ezra has a different approach. Here it says it's doubtful whether the king of Judah is meant. Correct. It is generally assumed in the commentaries that I've seen that it's not the king. The, um, that the, the Yud in the beginning is actually part of the name, and this is somebody named Yechezkiah. B'nai Veitzai. <coughs> Sorry. B'nai Veitzai. Shlosh meos esu mushlosha. Beitzai is 323. Bnei Yara meos shnei masar. Yara is 112. Bnei Chashum masai mesim u shlosha. Chashum is 223. Bnei Gibar tishim achamisha. Another small family. 95 for Gibar. And then we move into the family list. Now, even, even Gibar might be a place. How do they do it in here? They view Gibar as a person. They say the children of Gibar, but it's some, there's some debate on that score. Yeah. Is Heski such a common name that it would be a name other than the king? Why? I mean, why I, I, I don't know why it couldn't be. So we're saying it's a common name. I'm saying it could be. Okay. Yeah. They, Sorry. Here they think it was Gido, uh, a name for that for Gibalim. Yes. And so, that. Um, Nehemiah appears as Gibon. Yeah, but so what they're, what they're pointing out is that in the same list as it's going to show up in Nehemiah chapter 7, that where I said there are some variations, Gibar is Gibon, and that's the basis for suggesting that actually the list of places begins here. That's the, that's the idea. So according to that, this is, a, uh, this, is, this is places. Okay. Then you get into ones that are clearly places. Right, starting with uh, with Chafal of Lesendus twenty one, Bnei Beis Lachem Mea Esu Mushlosha Beit Lachem. That's when we know. Although Dot Maker records a debate about where, where this Beit Lachem yes. was and is it the Beit Lachem because there are multiple Beit. Right, well the word Beit Lachem, House of Bread. I mean, really, that's kind of generic in terms of uh, you know, in terms of of uh, names. And yeah, multiple places could be Beit Lachem. So Mea Esu Mushlosha one twenty three from there. Then we get Anshe Netaufa, and Ralph noted that we switched to Anshe for this one and a couple of others, and I don't know why. Chamisha Veshisha, 56 people from Netaufa. I did want you to know that Netaufa has a very important role in Jewish history. Take a look, please, on your sheet at source number eight. Gemari Antanis. Commenting on that list of who would bring wood for the Mizbeach and when they would bring it, one of them, in part of the part that I had ellipsized in source number four, includes a group which the Gemara says are the sons of Salmai of Netofa. For those who are reading the Hebrew, don't get hung up on the top versus the tet. There are different sources that spell it in different ways. But look at this story. Mayim b'nei Salmai anetofti. Who are the sons of Salmai of Netofa who used to bring wood? Amru, they said... Pam achas gazra malchus harish ashmad al Yisrael shloyaviu eitzim lamaaracha. At some point, the wicked government, wicked government in the Gemara always means Rome. Rome, correct. So at some point, historically, the Romans decreed that the Jews should not bring wood for the mizbeach. Voshivu pruzdaos al adrachim gederach shahoshiv yiravim ben nevad al adrachim shlo yalu Yisrael aregel. Just like when the northern and southern kingdom were split, yiravim ben nevad put roadblocks on the roads so that you couldn't go for the festival, you couldn't go to the Beis HaMikdash. So too, 
the Romans put out roadblocks to keep people from bringing wood to the, uh, to the Mizbeach. So what did the God-fearing people of that time do? They took their wood, they made it into ladders. They put them on their shoulder, and they went. Right? Sulam Salmai. That's the name, Salmai. They got to the roadblock. The Romans said, where are you going? So they said, We're going to the dove cuts over there to go get birds. And once they had passed, they dismantled them and brought them to Yerushalayim as, uh, as wood. I've heard variations of this story in, in, in other contexts. Um, a story in a science fiction uh, book about, um, about warriors who were fighting and they had horses that, they, you know, that were always searched by the enemy and they never figured out what it was, but they were, they were importing were the horses. That was an old wheelbarrow. It's a very, it's a punchline of a Okay. Okay, you have to tell me the fabulous joke later. No, I don't, you know, there's no line, because I already know the dash and hyphen explanation, so sorry. <laughs> the, um, but yes, the, um, there's also one with bicycles, the uh, bicycles in sand. So there are, there are multiple variations on this story, but anyway, these are the people of Natofa. So now you know something about Natofa. Anshe Anasos, Mea Esimushmona, this is a big deal, this one. In uh, in Pasuk Chav Gimel, it's in its twenty three. The people of Anatot. What is Anatot? It's destroyed. It's destroyed. And one of the Nevi'im. Yirmiyahu. Min Hakohanim Asher Ba Anasos. Right. Yirmiyah is one of the Kohanim from Anasos, and that's where he goes when God tells him he's going to destroy the Beis Hamikdash. God says to him, "Go there and get the deed for the land, and you'll, you'll put it away as a sign that you're going to come back." Anasos is a big deal city, but what I want to show you is what I noted for you on your sheet. Take a look, please, at Yirmiyahu, Jeremiah, chapter eleven. Jeremiah, chapter 11. It's page 1,100 and... No, 1,099. Sorry, no, 1,101. That is it. Jeremiah. 1101 in the Tanakh. Jeremiah 11, verse 21. Okay. <coughs> you see it? Yeah. Verse 21. It's there on your sheet. I, uh, you have the numbers. God says, The people are telling you not to prophesy. God says to them, I am going to punish them. The young will die by the sword. Their children will die in famine. They will have no remnant. Well, then why are they coming back for the second base HaMikdash? What happened? So, and I brought you another reference in chapter 16 in your meow, but really that's redundant at this point. That's the same idea. So how do I understand what happened? So the sages looked at this, and take a look at source number 10, the Medrash in Vayikorava. It says, al happens is this is part of a Medrash that's discussing whether prayer is key, repentance is key, or whether you need both, if you want to be forgiven for a wrongdoing. So the position of Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi, not Rish Lakish, which I wrote on your sheet in the translation, that should say Rabbi Yehuda ben Levi. That's a mistake. The Amar Tshuva Asta as Hakol. The position of Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi is that repentance does everything. You don't even need prayer. Mimi et Allah made. How do you know that? Where do you learn that from? From the people of Anatot. For the fact that God gives this punishment, this decree of punishment, and yet they are listed, they have continuity. Clearly, they're back in the second base on Mikdash, in the second temple, they return. So that's one answer. That's the Medrash's answer is they did tshuva, and God is not going to punish them if they've repented. It happened in Nineveh too. It happened in Nineveh too. You got it. Source number 11, the Malbim gives you another answer in which he does not presume repentance, but he says if you read the decree carefully, it's a decree against those who were there at the time, as well as the children born in Anatot. But their descendants could still survive. What moves Malbim to not use this Medrash? Possibly the fact that we're missing a story. In other words, if that were really true, that they repented and they were accepted from this decree, that would have been news in those days. 
<laughs> when everything else is going south, so to speak, you know, the, um, you know, it would have been news if a city really did chupa. They repented. I think that's what Malam is doing. He's sticking to the text itself and saying the answer is that the decree wasn't against them. But that's anatot, a good thing to be, uh, to be aware of. Back on page 1817. So, after Anatot, B'nai Azmavet, Arba'a Ush, Arba'im Ushnayim. Azmavet is a great name for a place. The um, 42. Well, the strength of death or strong like death. If you think of the Pasuk in Shir Hashirim, Azak Hamavet, right? Ahava, right? Love is as strong as death. The, um, it, it's a, yeah, so maybe Azmavet is like that. However, the Dad Mikra says it's actually a butchering of pronunciation. It's a place called Chizma. The Chet and the Ayin, both you know, being from the throat. So I don't know if he means Chizma came from Azmavet or Azmavet came from Chizma. But that's what the Dad Mikra suggests. And then we get B'nai Kiryat Arim the people of Kiryat Arim, which is indeed Kiryat Ye'arim, which we are quite familiar with. What are the people of Kiryat Ye'arim famous for? Shmuel Aleph. Is that what they, 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 they dropped? It's where the Aron was. Yeah. It's where the Aron was. Remember that the, the Jews went to war against the Plishtim, and they took the Aron to war inappropriately. The Plishtim conquered it, conquered them, captured the Aron, and then sent the Aron back when they ran into trouble. The Aron first goes to Beit Shemesh, and the people in Beit Shemesh are getting, they suffer a plague when the Aron comes to them, and they turn to the people of Kiryat Yarim and say, hey, wouldn't you like the Aron? And the people of Kiryat Yarim take in the Aron, and they do wonderfully, they flourish. It's all in the sixth and seventh chapters of Shmuel Aleph. So Kiryat Ya'arim is that, uh, is that city. It's also, if you think back to the border cities that are identified between, Yeshua, between Yehuda and Binyamin, it's a border city. That's the other thing to know about it. So Kiryat Ya'arim, Kfira Ube'erot. So this is an accumulation of three cities. Shvameos Varboim Ushlosha. 743 from among these cities. Okay. B'nei HaRama V'Gava. Again, two places together. Raman, Gava, Sheish Meos, Esrim, Ve'achad, 621. Anshe Michmas. Michmas is another one of those areas that we are familiar with as a border place. Meya Esrim, Ushnayim, 122. Anshe Be'el, Ve'ha'ai, two places we know to be close together from Parshas Lach Lecha. Masayim, Esrim, Ushlosh, as well as Sefer Yahushua, when the Jews fought their war against Ai. And Be'el wanted to join in. Masayim Esu Mushlosha, 223. Okay. The. What did I just lose there? B'nai Nevo, Chamisha Mushnaim Nevo is 52. Now, here, interestingly, Ibn Ezra says Nevo is a person, mm-hmm. but the Dat Mikra says Nevo is Nov, which is, a, yeah, which is a, a place, a known place. What do they do in the, in the art scroll? Which side do they vote with? They take it as, uh, as a city. Anything to side against Ibn Ezra. Okay. <laughs> the um, B'nai Magbish, Mea Chamisha B'Shisha. Magbish, 156. Magbish, unclear whether this is a location or a person. Again, Ibn Ezra says that it is a, uh, that it is a person. And again, the art scroll says it is a place. <laughs> and then, Pazak Lam and Allah, 31. B'nai Elam Acher, the other Elam. Uh-huh. Elef Masayim Chamishim Verba, 1254. Does that number ring a bell? I can, we've been sitting here reading numbers all day. The, um, can you guess which other place had the number of 1254? The other Elam. The other Elam. Both Elams happen to have, none of these places have had the same number. We've got crazy numbers here. It's not like in Chumash, where everything ends in a round number. Right? There's like one that ends in a 50, and everyone's like, wow, that ended in a 50. That was strange, because all the other numbers have, have at least a couple of zeros at the end. No, happens to be 1,254. So it will not surprise you to know that the uh, you know, Bible critic read will be to say, this is just a misplaced item on the list, and some, you know, somehow the list included Elam twice. But I think that's a very hard explanation, because then why they write Acher? It, they're clearly cognizant of the fact that they have a problem. They may have numbers. 
uh, so you could say maybe it's a number problem. That could be. I mean, so I, all the traditional commentators look at it and say, yeah, isn't that weird? And then they just go on. The Mitzvah um, David says, yeah, that's why it has to say Acher, because otherwise you'd get confused and say, didn't I just learn about an Elam that had 1254? Why do I have another Elam that has 1254? So now by saying Acher, it's saying, yeah, we know. This is really strange, but that was just the way it was. B'nei... Sorry? So happened. So happened, apparently. B'nei Charim, Shlosh Meyos Ve'esrim. So Charim 320... Charim also may be a, uh, a place. We're going to actually come back to Charim in a little bit. And then B'nai Lod, Chadid Va'ono, Shvameos, Esu V'chamisha, combination of Lod, which we do know as a place. We also know Ono as a place. Right. Shvameos, Esu V'chamisha, although that may just be named for this Ono, I'm not sure. Shvameos, Esu V'chamisha, 725. B'nai Yerecho, there's a familiar place. Shlosh Meos, Abba Emma Chamisha, 345. B'nai Sina'a, Sina'a was one of the wood donors. Shloshim, 3,630. That's a serious family. That has concluded the list of Yisraelim. Now we move into the Kawadim and Levim. Uh, yeah, so already back in Sefer Yoshua and Sefer Shoftim, we find people living in Yericho, and it's assigned to Shvatim. And so the, the assumption is that there are areas outside of the city, villages that are identified based on this metropolis. And that's the usual answer. But you find it built up already within, uh, within Tanakh, including at one point when it's built up illegally against us, and then, and then he gets punished for it. So now we get the Kohanim. So we have our, our, our list of four. Hakohanim, B'nei Yedaya, Lebeis Yeshua, Chameos Shiva Mushlosha. The sons of Yedaya, who was of the house of Yeshua, that's the way it's read, Yeshua being very important, because he's going to be the Kohen Gadol. So that's 973. B'nei Imer, Elav Hamishim Ushnayim, Imer, 1052. B'nei Pashkur, Elav Masayim, our boy in Pashkur has 1247. He was so close to being another Elam. And then B'nei Charim, Elav Meshiva Asar. And then Charim, 1,000 Seventeen. Those are our um, those are our four charim. Maybe a location. It's that David thinks that it's a uh, that it's a location because we saw charim among the Yisraelim in, in Pasuk Lamed Bet, sentence thirty-two. He says, "Yeah, it was a place, and there were Kohanim who lived there, and there were Yisraelim who lived there. Not every city of Kohanim had to be exclusively of Kohanim, apparently." And then we get the Leviim, and here things get strange. How Leviim? B'nei Yeshua v'kadmiya l'vnei Odavia shivim ve'arba'a. The Leviim, descendants of Yeshua, the, uh, this must be some other Yeshua because he's a Kohen, Kadmiel, of the sons of Hodavia. In other words, Hodavia is the father. His kids are Yeshua and Kadmiel. That's the Mitzudat David read, and I think it's the simplest one. 74. I would have expected more Leviim. Now, the next two psukim give us Hamishorim, the singers, Bnei Asaf, who we mentioned in Tehillim, right? Meya Esim 128. Sorry? And then Bnei Ashoarim, the sons of the people who, who uh, would hold the gates open, they'd open the gates for the temple. Bnei Shalom, Bnei Ater, Bnei Talmud, Bnei Akuf, Bnei Chatita, Bnei Shovai, Hako, all these families together, Meya Shloshim Betisha, 139. Which means that there is a debate as to these singers and gatekeepers as to whether they are Levian as well. But taking the view they are Levian, because that is a prominent view, it's Rashi's view among others, that gives me a grand total of 341 Levian for an entire tribe. Like a tribe of, uh, minus the Kohanim. So it's a tribe minus the Kohanim. Given that Kohanim are such a tiny minority of Shevet Levi, remember the, how the lineage works. Levi has three sons, Gershon, Kahat, and Merari. Kahat has, <coughs> sorry, Amram, Yitzhar, Chevron, and Uziel, four sons. And out of Amram, you have Moshe, Aaron, and Miriam. Aaron's kids are the Kohanim. That means that they are one, like, 24th or so of the family. Why in the world, frankly, there are more Kohanim here than there are Levian? It's today, too. Today, too. Really. If you go to Shul, yeah. Yeah. Because the Kohanim know who they are. I, mean, I think... I think it's talked about more when kids grow up that you're a Kohen. 
Mm -hmm. And the VM never occurs second. Right. So the conventional, ex the conventional explanation is that there's not much cachet in being a late V. That's right. You know, you don't really get to do cool things. But that's true now. In their day, it wasn't true. In their day, you got the tithe, you got the miser, right? In their day, you sang in the Beis HaMikdash. If you were a lady without a voice, and mainly you didn't want to come back. They, uh, you would be a, you know, the person who held the door. But, they, but you still, like, it, it was something of status, yeah. But number one is those who came back. And number two, I'm wondering, were they decimated in greater numbers, possibly? Because they were working in the temple? Then why did the Kohanim survive? And more Kohanim wanted to come back because it's, um, it's a greater status. The Kohanim have more to come back for? Possible. Listen Take a look. Dot Mikra offers a novel approach. I haven't seen anybody else suggest this, but I find it interesting. Take a look at Yechezkel 44, 9 to 14. I gave you the reference on your sheet in number 12. So you can see it there as well. It is page 1317. The art scroll headlines this paragraph with the apt words, traitors stay away. Sure. Sentence 9 to 14, it's on page 1317. It's Yechezkel chapter 44, sentences 9 to 14. Thus said the Lord Hashem Elohim, in the interest of time, I'm just going to do this quickly. Any estranged person, uncircumcised heart, uncircumcised flesh, does not enter my sanctuary. Any estranged person on the children of Israel... But those Levites who distance themselves from me during Israel's straying, when they strayed from me after their idols, they shall bear their iniquity. And he goes on to talk about them. They ministered to the people before the idols. They became a stumbling block of iniquity. I have raised my hand against them. They shall bear their iniquity. They shall not approach me to serve me or approach my holy places. And Levi look at themselves and think, we're going to sit this one out. <laughs> we're not wanted here. And so that's Dot Mikra's suggestion for why they don't uh, why they don't return. It's not just a question of well, Kohanim get more than we get because they could get more than Yisraelim get. It's a matter of them being intimidated. The um, that's the that would be at least one answer. The only question I have against this approach is then why is it that the numbers of the Kohanim are so much stronger per capita? A higher percentage of Kohanim are coming back. The Kohanim are in the same curse. Yeah. Were the Levium worse than the Kohanim? Did the Kohanim, you know, the lure of getting a carbon outweigh the fear of traitors stay away? I don't know. But I, I find that a very interesting suggestion that because they were singled out for condemnation, and it's not only here, there are other instances of condemnation of the Levium who had sinned, that this is uh, what they did. There will be a reaction to this. In chapter 8, Ezra responds to the lack of Levium by punishing them. And yeah. we'll get to that in uh, in chapter eight, and we'll talk about then what the what the punishment what the punishment is. We'll pick up with this then, God willing, uh, next week.